I'm here at Theater J with Josh Lefkowitz, who is starring in The Rise and Fall of Annie Hall. Joining Josh is his director, Shirley Saratsky. Well, thanks for being here, Josh and Shirley. How are you doing? We're good. We're really good. We're glad to be here. I'm thrilled to be here. It's very exciting. Are you sure? I'm sure. <laughs> a little nervous, well, let's but talk. thrilled. A director's nervous? Come on. Totally nervous. This is... God, it's justice, isn't it, Josh? There's this really interesting, uh, like, uh, alien-looking orb that we're talking into right now, and uh, this is definitely a first time for me, so it's, uh, it's great. It's really, uh, yeah, I understand the nerves. I've, I've got a bit of them, too. Yeah. So tell us what The Rise and Fall of Annie Hall is about from the point of view of Henry Bloom, who you play. Yeah, it's the story of uh, a struggling uh, composer, writer of musicals who's trying to get a hit. He's, he's approaching the precipice of 30, and he hasn't really had any success in New York for... Uh, just about the eight years that he's been living there. The, the last time he had any taste of success was in college uh, at Northwestern. And so he, he's really at a breaking point. He, you know, he, he's not doing anything that he feels is worthwhile. He, he's been in a relationship with the girl that he met in college for 12 years now, and they're not sure whether they want to make that final leap into the great ring ceremony, et cetera. And so he's really, he's, he's really at a bit of a break. Uh, that's where we start anyways. So what's the show about from the director's point of view? Um, I think the show is about uh, young people kind of making that transition from the 20s to the 30s. Um, for me, the being in your 20s, you know, is this time when anything can happen. And I think this play captures that really well. You can end up encountering the most amazing people you'd ever imagine, people you'd never expect to meet, um, or like ending up at a party you never meant to be at. You move, you know, things change so quickly in your 20s. You, you, you could be in a relationship for years and then it, it, one night it, it ends. And because you have less, uh, ideally, usually, you have less definite baggage that those changes can happen more quickly. So I, I really feel like this is a, a story about um, these five characters who, the one character is younger than the others, but the others are right on the verge of 30 or are, are you know, have just recently turned 30. And it's it's about exiting childhood, exiting, not childhood, but, but that young adult phase and kind of taking on um, the the helm of being your own adult um and they all have to make decisions and choices and be more active in sort of taking charge of their life and i think a lot of loss comes with that but a lot of um a lot a lot is gained as well so it's it's watching these these characters go through the growing pains of that period of time so how do you relate to Henry, Josh? Oh, incredibly. Uh, very much so. <laughs> you I, look like him. Yeah, oh, thank you. <laughs> I think that's probably one of the reasons I, I got the, the offer to play the role. I mean, it's he's, you know, he's a struggling writer. I, in my greatest moments, like to imagine that I could write something, too. Um, he, <laughs> you know, he, he's he's been in a, a long-term relationship with a, a girl that he met in college. I, I had that experience and, and, and wrote about that. <laughs> that's the thing I wrote. And wrote and wrote and uh you know he's he's ambitious i think i, I must have a slice of his ambition too I'm, I'm sure it's there and uh he is jewish i'm you know shalom hello uh he that's it but uh I, he's totally cute and charming <laughs> yeah well i don't know no it's it's and it's, funny it's, yeah and, and it's funny. funny it's very easy for me to slip on uh, there was funny some uh, woman was at the show yesterday i guess she she's ushered around town quite a bit she's seen everything and she came right up while I was doing my warm-ups on stage, and she said, I've seen all of your one-man shows, even the little 10-minute thing that you did at the Madcap Festival, you know, years back when you were living in D.C. And I said, oh, that's so great. She said, but I've never seen you do any acting before. I said, well, you're not going to see any acting today either because it's the same basic character. But uh, I, love, I love playing that sort of role. I love relating to an audience. I love to speak directly to them. Um, you know, shake them up a bit, wake them up, do everything in, in my power to uh, keep them entertained and engaged. So it's a, it's a really nice fit for me. So, Shirley, what personal experiences did you draw upon to direct this show? Well, as a... Uh, just past my 30, 30 at the, I mean, I'm 33, so I'm a little bit older than these characters that we're seeing on stage. Um, but, I, you know, the, they've all gone to school... Uh, really with the goal of having a life in theater and I did that as well I actually originally went to school for musical theater um, and did that for two Where'd years 
I went to the University of Michigan. Yeah. yeah. Where Josh actually went, but, you know, I'm much older than Josh, so we didn't overlap <laughs> at all. Um, but uh, so I went to school with a lot of people with big dreams about making it specifically in musical theater, um, including composers and lyricists. And I've, I've had a number of friends both from school and then my my I spent a couple of years in New York after graduating from school and and very much watched this experience of a few years out of school people struggling because things didn't turn out the way you expect it to I mean I think you know you go to these you go into these programs and they're they're pretty selective programs and you sort of go through four years of school and think I mean, I made it here and I'm going through these four years. So when I get out, I am going to take this this career field by storm. And, you know, usually that means taking New York by storm um, and I and watching myself and, and my classmates sort of over the years, you know, that we've been out of school how that doesn't necessarily happen that way. And or what rarely, you, happens, rarely that. happens that way and what you do what you do to then re-envision your dreams a little bit um, and what that is to let go of those kind of childish dreams and then say, OK, what is it that really fulfills me and what what from this career field? Why am I why am I here? Why am I still here? Um, and, and it's hard. And, you know, there are the people who there are the f people who make it big and you watch them like your friends who suddenly are hanging around with the the jet set and 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 it breaks up into all these echelons of how successful you are and you know you can feel really insecure about if i'm particularly you know when you're not living in new york and not working in new york and i mean then los angeles and california becomes a whole other thing but but whether you feel validated in what you do and and it's so much in your you know in our own minds about who who we, we've earned the right to sort of play with, as it were, and who we haven't, and how much that can just sort of cripple you. So those are all, all the, those, those, you know, sad aspects are there. You know, the fun stuff, I, these guys love musical theater. I love musical theater. That, that's the kind of bottom line of that part of it. So are you both Woody Allen fans? Oh, yeah, absolutely. He's, he's a top five hero for me, for sure. Um, <laughs> I, I there are many of his movies that I have not yet seen, but uh, one of the things I most admire about Woody Allen is his work ethic. He makes a movie he makes a movie a year, and uh, that is outstanding. I can't think of another director who has had that uh, level of productivity over that amount of time. And uh, yeah, I, I I think he is a consummate artist, always changing uh, form and genre. I I, I really greatly admire his oeuvre if i'm saying it right <laughs> and and, and uh, i yeah to, to work with him someday is a dream but he's getting old so who knows <laughs> and he's a good clarinet player he right? is, oh, he that's is. the sort of thing like steve martin with steve martin with his banjo i mean i just like these i i, I hesitate to use the word because it's a little pretentious but it's sort of a renaissance i mean you know you could i mean both of these guys you could open your new yorker and you'd see like uh a witty comic piece, you know, by them, and then a movie's coming out, or, or that you know Steve is in. I I say it like I know his name. That Steve Martin is in, or <laughs> the Woody Allen directed, and then they're going on tour with their bluegrass bands, or you know clarinet and big band, and it's amazing. I mean that that's a career that a any aspiring actor or writer or director um, would hope to have someday. And you, Shirley? I am. Um, I, you know, coming into this when this show, I had some sort of goal of watching all of his films, and that so didn't happen because there's just too many of them. Um, so, what's your favorite? Uh, well, I mean, historically, Annie Hall has been my favorite, and and it's such a great movie. And you know, the but but I did watch some of the earlier stuff that I'd not seen before, the 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 more slapsticky comedy stuff, and that's great too. Um, you know, and then there's the the ones where you get a little annoyed with seeing him again. <laughs> I think sometimes he benefits by by as he's as he's recently appeared less in his movies. I think he's expanded even more in in different ways as an artist. Um, but I do love how in each film he sort of captures so much, particularly when they're set actually in the time that he was making them, he captures so much about, I mean, the, the line in the play is about the, the zeitgeist, the New York zeitgeist thing. And he, he does sort of, you could go to 
a film you know made in 1978 and watch it and it's it's like there's 1978 you make you watch his films from the mid 80s and they're so mid 80s so it's it's really a great um a great kind of archiving of history in his films so josh now that you're in an ensemble piece mm -hmm. so what's harder to do a one-man show or work in uh in a play like rise and fall of annie hall with a group of other people and actors uh, I think that the one-man shows are probably more difficult because there's nobody else that you get to uh, share the energy with. Um, I love doing the solos. I, I find it, as mentioned earlier, I really find it very engaging to play with an audience. I, I'm very nervous beforehand because, again, there, there's it's all, it's all on me uh, when I'm doing the solos, and if they're not happy, I've no one to blame but myself. Uh, but I, I, I do, you know, get off on that experience. But... Um, with the, with the ensemble, the trick for me and, and what I've really been working hard on is when I get a little too outside of the world of the play and I'll start to really, you know, focus in on the audience, that person is looks like they're dozing off or that person is very engaged, you know, pro or con. Um, w when my mind goes there, I, I find I have to remind myself, oh yeah, I'm not present in the scene. And what I'm really fortunate about with this ensemble is we've got just the top-notch actors I mean just well introduce the cast yeah so uh, Matthew Anderson plays will my writing partner uh, a gay stoner dude uh, he's <laughs> he is hilarious Matt Matt is a Mormon he's never you know smoked oh, no. or drunk anything oh, no. in his life so we had a whole uh, pot smoking session we, we did I think there are probably some pictures on Facebook still <laughs> for those interested we had many people involved and it, the funny thing was other actors designers got involved and it became this several several people said honestly well my my dad smokes more pot than I do <laughs> one of our designers one of our actors both had that to say and 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 they were both serious, which was the strangest thing, and I guess speaks a bit of our generation that now we can say some of us, our parents, Smoke had more. more drug experience than we did. Yeah, but. yeah. Then um, uh, Alexander Strain plays the tortured genius who's sort of the foil to uh, <laughs> my character, and he's, he's outstanding. I, I knew of Alexander. I'd never met him before, but I, I knew, you know, his reputation in town for being a really, you know, fantastic actor. And I guess also normally doing really serious pieces and uh so I, I didn't know how that would play and it's it's just been a joy i mean that my scenes with alexander i really try to i, I mean my scenes with everyone i try to remain present with them because they're all so great but I, I think that i don't know maybe it's like sibling stuff coming up from like you know growing up i don't want to get too therapy about it but like when you know <laughs> i know that he had this reputation coming in and i like to think i have a bit of a chip on my shoulder and so it was engaging in the most uh wonderful way i mean we found a, a nice real um on stage rivalry that correlates to backstage hysterics that uh, i'm really <laughs> delighted to be a part of he's having a party tonight and i'm going to it too um <laughs> and i'm sorry to, and then um maureen roan plays uh the producer's daughter and uh, she you know she's straight out of school which was adorable <laughs> in a <laughs> rehearsal to you know she probably was the smiliest of us all just elated to be having this first uh, professional experience and I tell you in, in the rehearsal process and, and Shirley can speak of this too she she got tossed and turned quite a bit throughout because I think her character became a litmus test for quite a lot of people who were watching the show they would inject their own experience of their own producer's daughter by which I mean uh, the, the girl from their past that they lusted after and 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 maybe never got to attain in high school or college or whatever and so Maureen to her credit took it all in stride and built a, just a wonderful character that lands some of the evening's biggest laughs every mm -hmm. night and then Tessa Klein who uh, you know I also I knew of and had, had met her in New York and uh, she's outstanding and, and Tessa probably has the most challenging role just in terms of the script um, who she, does she play? I'm sorry she's yeah Annie. oh she plays Annie she plays uh, Henry's girlfriend uh, for 12 years and so you know, our, our journey with those scenes was how do we carve out an awareness to the audience that these are two people who really love each other and um, have, a, have a shared history that is that cannot be replicated by anything other than an immense amount of time spent together and experiences had together. And Tessa handles it beautifully and she's so wonderful. I, I, I happen to notice some of the reviews, both like two different reviews, both called her appealing, which we <laughs> tease her about backstage, but she is. She's incredibly appealing on stage. She's a joy to play with. I, I, I am. I love our cast. And so to go back to the question that, 
you know, when I start getting into that solo space where I'm like thinking, ah, oh, it's about me and the audience, all I have to do is remind myself that there are these like incredible actors on stage. And if I can just give to them the way that they're so giving to me, uh, that's, that's when we hit our best marks. So tell us about some of the outrageous things that happened during rehearsal. Anything weird happened during a performance? Sorry, did I bogart that, by the way? Did you? <laughs> okay. No. Because I know, like, Shirley would have, like, Well, a... let Shirley answer this one. Oh. Outrageous things that happened during rehearsal? During rehearsals or on, during a performance? Uh, well, during performance, y you could speak more, too. Um, during rehearsal, you know, we did have, it was a very, we laughed a lot in rehearsal. <laughs> yeah. Both show-related moments and sometimes non-show-related moments. Um, I don't think I've ever had so much just fun in a rehearsal process. And I've had some really fun, awesome rehearsal processes. I mean, I wouldn't still be doing this if I hadn't. Um, but but this was a this was a blast. Yeah, it was the most fun I've had in a rehearsal in a long long time uh just a total joy the the piece is not so challenging i mean and i don't mean that as a slight to what sam has written because i'm sure the crafting of it was its own challenge but he has built such a a wonderfully funny genuine funny not not a dramedy or a you know comedic drama which i guess is a dramedy i mean this is a straight up comedy and and they're characters that are very uh relatable for us we realized that early on in the process and so that freed us up incredibly to just play, try comedic bits. Uh, one, one experience that I would have is I would go home and watch a Woody Allen movie, and then I would come in and like try to implement that into the scene. And I, I'm, I'm not the only actor that did this, but I can only speak to my own experience. And, uh, you know, the, I think Shirley's rule of thumb was if we could justify it by citing it from the Woody Allen movie then it would work. I tried some bit with like like a stack of cards like that was just really clowny and, and probably more Bill Irwin than Woody Allen kind of out of place <laughs> and uh, there, there was some eye rolling going on from behind the table and I said well Woody does stuff like that and take the money and run I just watch it on Netflix on demand. Yeah that's a plug right there Netflix on demand if you want to get behind our show. <laughs> and, uh, and Shirley said, all right, so then we'll keep it in. And it's landed some nights. Maybe <laughs> some nights it's a little much. <laughs> Let's talk about Sam Foreman because he was here. Did he work with you when he was here? Uh, he Sam was here for the first, you know, we did a first reading of this play over a year ago. And he was there for that first reading here in the library, the very library where, where we are recording this podcast. Um, and then he came down for the first, we did a read in October where Sam was here. And, and uh, was the cast then? The cast with with the cast with the cast. Yeah, okay. we did a, a day of sort of a workshoppy day. He had um, he d made some done some rewrites between you know the spring and the fall, and then he was here for the first four days of rehearsal. Once we went into rehearsal, and then again was here during tech um, at the end of tech. So uh, he's been. I mean, he certainly was present enough that we we got a lot of great stories of his impetus for writing the play what he wanted to say with the play, even just uh, some, and, you know, him explaining some of the humor, if, if there was things we didn't get. Um, and he is a hilarious guy himself. So he was just fun to have around. And, you know, you see a lot of where Henry comes from, from Sam as well, when you get to spend some time with him. And that was the, like the perfect amount of time, I feel, for this play, for this writer and for this ensemble, you know, led by Shirley as our director. I mean, to have him there initially in those first couple days while we were doing table work was invaluable. Um, and then he got out of there and we got to build our show, which is is great. And you don't always luck out in that way. I mean, for, for some plays and for some experiences, that's not appropriate. The, the writer might be at a different stage with the piece. He or she may need to be there for longer and uh, have greater input as it's having you know leading towards its world premiere that's totally acceptable but for this particular project it was just so nice to get all of that input uh right at the beginning and then sam just left and we built this this sh show and then sam came back right before you know the previews and into the previews little cuts and changes here and there to, to tighten things up in moments that he needed or, or desired differently and uh and there we were it was it was really fortunate on our end 
that it, that it worked out that way. So did he offer you any advice on your character or how to play your character? No, no. He was really like pretty cool about it the whole time. He just, uh, I, I read the script back in April when they were doing a reading and trying to decide whether it was going to be in the season or not. This was so, uh, yeah, I guess a year ago. And, uh, and when I read the script, it was sent to me in New York and I was reading it and I just thought, this guy is like, I know this guy, I got to do this, this play. And I got in touch with Sam and I said, dude, you got to come see this evening. I was doing like an evening of, you know, highlights from my two solo pieces and some other like new writing things with like other characters on stage. And Sam came to check it out. And it was at Ars Nova, which is this like awesome place in New York that Sam himself has worked at and continues to work at. And he came and saw it just based on that email exchange. And he, he found me afterwards. It was like really cool. He gave me this big hug and he's like, dude, you're perfect. You got to play the role. And I was like, <laughs> I know, man, I want to. So it was great. So how do you direct a guy who's so hysterically funny, who's an actor and who's performed one man shows, who has incredible energy like the Ever Ready Bunny? How did you do it? <laughs> or did you do it? How did you do it? Um, you know, it was interesting. I actually, I don't know if I've even ever said this to Josh, but I was nervous going into it because um, we've been friends for a while and I've, you know, we've, we've, I've seen him in shows and I've seen his shows and he's seen my shows and I think we've been both friends and sort of have a level of mutual respect for each other's work in the theater but had never worked together and I didn't know how that would work. Um, but he's an extremely communicative guy in the space. No. <laughs> totally. No, he's not. I mean, this no. is not a selfish actor. None of them are. But, um, you know, it was a, I, I think we, we sort of learned a way to check in with each other when we needed to. Um, there was a, a good amount of freedom, but that's kind of how I run all of my rehearsal processes. I, I like people who come up with a lot of choices. Um, and I, this was a great group in, in that vein. Uh, I didn't feel like I had to tell anyone what to do, um, but we were able to sort of start coming up with ideas and, and play with scenes. And then it was about just sort of nudging in one direction or the other. Um, and, and, you know, Josh is an extremely specific actor as well. Uh, and that's a delight to work with. And, and you can say the littlest thing and, and he sort of gets it. And then we can say, okay, let's run it again. Let's try it again. And it all, it all fits in there and it all registers to him in a way that then you completely see the next time you do it without talking too much about it. So thanks. Well, I don't know how I'll get out of this room with this giant head that I have right now, <laughs> but, uh, no, for, am I, if I'm allowed to also say like, it was, it was. It was awesome. I've never been directed by a friend before, by mm -hmm. someone who and I... you're still friends, right? Yeah, we made it through. <laughs> and uh, we're going to that party tonight. I'd never worked like that before, and I found very quickly that I, I was probably... I think both because of the role um, and, and the onstage presence throughout, coupled with a shared history with Shirley, uh, very quickly on I realized I am speaking in a different way, in a probably more vocal manner than I would in another rehearsal space because of the shared history and because of the demands, for the way that the character and the arc of the story intertwine so, so very much. And so I checked in about that to myself, actually, a couple days into the rehearsal room, and I thought, is this okay to, to be this way? Um, or am I behaving like a, like a jerk, like a prima donna or something like that? And ultimately, you know, what was so fulfilling about the experience was not only was it okay, it was we, we were able to go deeper, quicker, and faster because of the shared history and uh, experiences. There was a shorthand, Shirley could mention, you know, a few syllables and words, and I knew exactly what she was pulling, either from my particular past or our particular pasts. And uh, and it's not unlike, I said this to the, to the board members of Theater J when I came in and talked to them about the show, and I said, you know, August Osage County is this like amazing piece of theater that I just, I never seen anything like it. And I was fortunate to see the original cast and it, it, in on Broadway. And they, you know, they brought them straight from Steppenwolf. And those are actors that have worked together for decades. And so offstage, some of them have dated, uh, married, divorced, you know, gone through tremendous life experiences side by side. Uh, in one play, someone's been father and son, and in the next play, they've been brothers. So they have such a history, which combines to create, s in, in that play in August, such an amazing 
replication of a family unit on stage. And I thought, this is the benefit of working with someone with whom I have a history because we can cut through the politeness and the kindness and get right to it. And um, no one's afraid to speak up for their artistic belief. And there's nothing better than, uh, a, a, you know, strong-minded individuals both working towards a common goal. I, I would do it again in a heartbeat, and uh, I hope I get to. Well, let's talk about your favorite lines from the show or a scene that you really love. For, uh, for me, it's when I get to speak directly to the audience. I, I probably ad-lib just a little... Well, that was my next question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, 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 just a little bit, and Sam never said it was, you know, he didn't seem to mind it. He seemed to encourage it. The script pretty much encourages it. I mean... At the end of the first act, there's, you know, well, let's finish the, let's take a break here and we'll come back in about 15 minutes and finish up the story. How does that sound? Okay, good, mm -hmm. cool. See you guys in a few. Well, they start clapping halfway before I get to the end there. They're like, yeah, yeah, it's great. Either they're like, yes, let's let us out. We want to go get water or whatever. Or we have to use the bathroom. <laughs> but more often than not, they're engaged in the story and they're responding uh, to the character. And so that, that allows for a little bit of ad libbing and, and Shirley never said, you know, that's not okay, which is like, until until I hear those words, I'm going to keep doing it. <laughs> I did say, but we did have a conversation about, do we have to learn the lines, like, exactly with every dude and, like, in place? And I did say yes Yeah, we tried our best. We just did our open captioning performance on Thursday night, <laughs> and the, the, the script was over on the side, and the actors backstage were joking. I wonder if we're about 55% accurate. I mean, he's, <laughs> the, the, the lines are so specific. I don't want to say David mamet ask, but um, there is... A likeness to that in the commas, ellipses, and the, the and where the dudes mm -hmm. and the likes and the you knows are placed. I mean, they're really informative for the actors to learn. But yeah, we probably do uh, muck around a little bit with that. Hopefully not to the script's detriment. But I, I like the moments best when when I, when there's a line that's you know you know that part in the Annie Hall where they go to visit the Maharishi. If you remember that, and sometimes people will nod or say yes, I do remember that, and I'll be like, okay, good. I'm glad you're paying attention. And uh, just any moment that I get to really, um, I get to p play with the, the people there to remind them that, you know, we, we know they're there. This, this, this play doesn't pretend like we don't know you paid for your seats and that you're sitting here right now enjoying this experience. We're glad you're here and we want you to be having a good time. What about you, Shirley? Your favorite scene or line in the show? Um, I would say, you know, there's something fantastic about that first scene because it launches us into the comedy so well. And it's something, it's so gratifying to watch those one liners start hitting and unapologetically, like one one liner after another, um, which does harken back to an earlier style of comedic writing, like Josh was saying before. Um, that's really gratifying to, to watch, uh, certainly in terms of like, the scenes that get me. I think when you get from the, well, I don't want to give away anything um, in the play, but when you do start getting into the scene where uh, Josh's character, Henry, talks about seeing seeing this great love of your youth and knowing it's ending, um, there's something in that speech that really gets to me. And then that leads into just these these moments that that you, as you get older, you look back at it and you say, oh, it was, you know, you can have the perspective of, it was just a breakup I had in my 20s. But at the same time, those breakups, those those losses and heartbreaks and also the, the, the love affairs that you had at those times, um, whatever they lead to, even though they don't last, you may never see the people again that you were involved with. Like those are the things that shape us so much for the rest of our lives. And those are the things that we never forget. And I think it's really well captured in a, the series of moments that that happens in the in the second act there. I remember, yeah, one day in rehearsal where I, I, I took Shirley aside at one moment and I said, you know, what is the point of this? Like we, we were working on that one, one of the challenging moments of Henry and Annie deciding whether or not to be together. And I said, you know, who cares? It's just a breakup. And, uh, and Shirley said, well, they care because this is the hardest experience they've ever had to go through. And probably she said, I don't remember if this is true, but might as well be true. You know, you care because <laughs> there was a time when this was for you. I mean, that, you know, one of the char Maureen's character jokes and says like, like people are being raped by their uncles and shit. My life is just not that tragic. And that's true for all of the characters in the show and true for, I, I, as far as I know, I don't know every, all of the actor's personal histories, but certainly this actor's personal history, that's true. And, and perhaps for a lot of our audience members as well. I mean, you know, we didn't serve in the war overseas and we never 
as far as I know, had to go through some horrible, abusive, gosh, I really shouldn't be saying this. I don't know if this is true or not. But the point is that for these characters, and, and certainly, for the, again, for this particular actor, if the greatest tragedy of your life is trying to decide whether or not the, the woman that you met at a young age is the woman that you're ultimately going to you know, be with for the rest of your life, and you're not sure if that's true or not, if that's the greatest tragedy that you go through, it is still a tragedy. It still hurts, and it still takes an awful... A uh, long time to process afterwards. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about working in the DC theater community because you've both been around a little bit around here, and we're glad you are. So why why is it so much fun working in the DC theater community, or not? Let's we'll start with Shirley. Well, uh, you know, I moved here about eight years ago, so <laughs> I've been here a while, which was never really expected that I would move here and stay here. Um, that choice kind of came about in the second or third year I, I lived here and realized that I wasn't going back to New York, um, despite, you know, an apartment I had there and was continually subletting and it finally said, you know, this is this has become my home. Uh, what I love about being here, I mean, honestly, the thing that kept me here from at first was well, for one, starting to get work, um, and probably some relationships that have since ended. <laughs> Speaking of, I mean, a series of those, which, yeah. Uh, but um, but it was the fact that I was getting to work with designers more than I ever had the opportunity to work with in New York. And, you, you know, there's, there's something great about having, you know, we still complain about some of the theater spaces in this city, but we have some really fantastic spaces and really, you know, interesting places that can be rearranged, places like H Street. Um, I mean, the, the theater here is the most traditional theater I've probably ever worked in, but I, I think there are just some really fantastic creative minds here in this city, other than actors and directors, that I've, as I've had the chance to work with them, I, I wouldn't, I don't want to give that up. Um, I also love working with the acting community here. And there is, you know, all the things that has been, have, have been said before, there's, there's a friendship factor, there is a community factor. These are the people who, when you're going through something professionally or personally, I have, you know, so many people I can turn to and call and say, can I talk about this to you? that is such a support system that um, I think we're really blessed to have. I surely pretty much hit it on the head. I lived here for about two years and um, since moved up to New York, but I would say my, my best professional experiences have continued to happen in DC, in the DC theater community. And I'm real grateful for that, that the spaces are gorgeous. The community is really strong and very tight. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure to continue to be loosely associated with it. I feel real grateful for that. Well, thanks for being here. I want to ask you one last question, yeah. which is what do you want audiences to take with them when they leave Theater J after seeing the rise and fall of Annie Hall? Their programs <laughs> <laughs> so they don't litter on the floor. No, I don't know. Um, gosh, uh, what do I want them to take? I, like a great time, like a really nice time had at the theater. It's not, so, it's not so challenging. You don't have to call your senator and ask for more money to be given to the starving children of Uruguay or <laughs> Uruguay or etc. It's just a really like pleasant, funny time at the theater. I hope that they laugh and then they tell their friends about it. And if they didn't laugh, you know, shut up. Nobody cares what you think. <laughs>